worship on the second Sunday of Christmas. When we gather each week, we light candles. Um, Sydney, will you light them for me? Um, we light one for Wiley Dobbs, who lives in prison in Georgia. We light one candle for our friends in Cuba, and especially for Kim and Stan, as they are there visiting right now. We light a candle for all whose lives are impacted by violence in all of its forms. We light a candle for all of us uh, whose lives have been impacted by COVID-19. And we light a candle for those who are not able to join us here today and for each of you. So here we are. Hi. Somebody's not muted. Hey, Matthew. Hey, Phoebe. If everybody can mute themselves, it's good to see y'all. Um, here we are again. Um, Zooming ourselves together. Um, thank you for being here for worship today. Um, I thought I would start with a reading from Jan Richardson um, that she wrote as a blessing for Epiphany. So I invite you to, wherever you are, um, get in a comfortable space and receive these words of blessing on this week that holds Epiphany. If you could see the journey whole, you might never undertake it, might never dare the first step that propels you from the place you have known toward the place you know not. Call it one of the mercies of the road, that we see it only by stages as it opens before us, as it comes into our keeping step by single step. There is nothing for it but to go and by our going take the vows the pilgrim takes to be faithful to the next step, to rely on more than the map, to heed the signposts of intuition and dream, to follow the star that only you will recognize, to keep an open eye for the wonders that attend the path, to press on beyond distractions, beyond fatigue, beyond what would tempt you from the way, these are vows that only you will know, the secret promises of your particular path and the new ones you will need to make when the road is revealed by turns you could not have foreseen. Keep them, break them, make them again. Each promise becomes part of the path. Each choice creates the road that will take you to the place where you at last will kneel to offer the gift most needed, the gift that only you can give before turning to go home by another way. I invite you to pass the peace of Christ as best we can here on Zoom. Peace of Christ be with each of you.
Um, I'll try to speak loudly. Uh, we, are, we are past Christmas. We're through another insane holiday. Um, and now we'll open up some space for our community to hold the things that are full of joy, the things that are heavy, the things that are weird and strange as they have been for two years plus now and more. Um, so if anybody has something that they'd like to share, I welcome you to share it now. I'm going to Zoom is tricky. I don't want to cut anybody off. So if everyone feels like they've had a chance to share, I can close us in prayer. Great. Gracious and loving God, thank you for making spaces in all ways for us to hold each other close even when we're far away. We are grateful for the people who bring your love to us through Zoom, through music, through sitting down at a table and taking copious notes on what this community needs. That's messy. <laughs> we are endlessly grateful and also pray for strength and courage as we move into yet another phase of this pandemic. Amen.
The gospel story tonight is from the second chapter of Matthew, the first 12 verses. Listen up, here's God's word. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Jerusalem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests they offered him gifts of gold frankincense and myrrh and having been warned in a dream not to return to herod they left for their own country by another road the word of god for god's people one sort of like it. This one's seen better days in the closet back in the back. It features prominently in our Christmas pageant every year. This long delayed Christmas pageant that we had hoped our children and youth and we would be enjoying today. This is the star that usually points the Magi toward the place where they can find the Christ child in Bethlehem. We don't often linger in this part of the story. This part of the story in Matthew gets fused together with Luke's version of Jesus's birth. And many other details have been impressed on this story over hundreds of years. For example, giving the Magi names and equating them with kings. 
Matthew's version with the Magi coming from the east following the star that they noticed when it rose in the sky gives us a good bit of detail about the Magi and their interaction with King Herod. The Magi were experts at reading the starry night skies, knowing the patterns, paying attention to anomalies, changes, and sudden appearances. What I love about the story of the Magi is their curiosity. They had somehow heard about the birth of this baby in Bethlehem. They didn't get word about the baby via social media, on Instagram or TikTok. Somehow though, word had gotten to them. And this was a moment when the Magi did have to look up and then look out beyond themselves. They had to put information that they had heard together with the star anomaly that they observed and make a decision about how they were going to respond. It required them to embark on a journey that was marked by more questions than answers. And I think sometimes those are the hardest journeys to take. But they were seekers and they were perceptive observers. Their curiosity about the signs and wonders, all that they were seeing and hearing surrounding the birth of the baby Jesus. It all compelled them to embark on this journey to find the Christ child. They had to extend themselves beyond what they knew as observable fact and attempt to understand and bear witness to something that was far out beyond their usual ways of knowing and observing the world around them. And it wasn't a real quick road trip. It was likely a very long journey. They didn't have a map, just a general idea of the direction they were going because they were following the star that had appeared above them. It's clear that they didn't know exactly where they were going, even when they got close because of the somewhat unfortunate pit stop they made in Jerusalem inquiring of King Herod and his leaders where this baby boy could be found. We learn in Matthew's version of events that King Herod was frightened by the question that the Magi asked. Where is this child who has been born? For we observed his star at its rising. And not only was Herod frightened, but Matthew tells us that all of Jerusalem was frightened with him. And my guess is that Herod was no amateur at stirring up fear and anxiety and anger among the people he ruled. Herod called together all the experts that he had around him to try and shed some light on a situation that so clearly filled him with fear. And they confirmed that, yes, the baby that the Magi had come to find really might be the one who had been promised, whose birth had been foretold. The word Herod received from the chief priests and the scribes was enough to set his own plan in motion, secretly calling the Magi and questioning them about the timing of when they first noticed this star in the sky. And then he had a special mission for them, to go and find the baby and then bring the news back to him exactly where the baby was so that he could go and pay homage to him too. I think the Magi were not only expert observers of the night skies, but they clearly were also astute observers of human behavior. The text doesn't say so, but I think they must have picked up on Herod's energy, his anxiety, his anger, and his fear. I kind of have a picture of Herod in my head, and the specific image I have comes from the week that lies ahead of us, this Thursday the actual day when we celebrate Epiphany in the Christian calendar, marks one year since the deadly violent extremist siege on the US Capitol in Washington, DC. This story reminds me that this is an age old story we see playing out across the arc of history, no matter the location or the time period. I'm struck by the predictable tendencies of the powers and principalities to resort to threats of violence when faced with a threat or challenge to their own power, violence enacted at any cost. What Matthew's Gospel doesn't mention that we know from other sources is that King Herod was ruthless and brutal in all of his dealings with other people, not just the people he ruled over, but also with his family. Some sources mention that Herod had several of his own family members killed during his reign. No one was safe under his rule not even his kin. So the Magi not only paid close attention to their primary work, 
and what they observed in the night skies, but they also attended to what was happening within themselves, their inner world of wisdom. The Gospel tells us that they were overwhelmed with joy, such a difference between what they had experienced when they met Herod, when they arrived at the place where Mary and Jesus and Joseph were staying. I often wonder what Mary and Joseph thought about so many strangers coming to see their baby. It's also made me think so much about how much I miss holding babies in this pandemic and how we can't go and see them and be close to them. In fact, um, a week or so ago, I met Amanda and uh, Amanda Orders and uh, Hunsucker and Jeff Hunsucker in the parking lot at their pediatrician's office to take them some food. Many of you will remember Amanda, who has been part of a, a part of Circle, but they live down in Morganton now. And I just had to look at that beautiful baby through the car window. But after their visit in a dream, they were instructed not to return to Herod. They didn't just say, I had the weirdest dream last night and dismiss it. Or maybe one of them did say that, and the other one responded, well, you're not gonna believe this because I had the exact same dream. However that conversation unfolded, they took the dream seriously and went home by another way, avoiding another interaction with Herod. What we know about the next part of the story is that Herod continued his hate and fear-filled rampage to seek out this infant child who had his own celestial star. Herod was determined to get rid of Jesus by any means necessary. Joseph and Mary were also very adept at listening to their own inner worlds of wisdom. Joseph was instructed in a dream to flee with Mary and Jesus to Egypt, to safety until the time came that they could return. Meanwhile, Herod was angry and infuriated and when he realized that he had been duped by the Magi. And in a rage, he made an order that all children in and around Bethlehem under the age of two be killed, thinking that this would thwart any rumblings of a threat to his own power. The story of the Magi continues to speak to us, and I keep wondering where we might find ourselves in the story this week. Maybe we can identify a part of ourselves in the blinding anger of Herod. Maybe we can find ourselves in the characters of the chief priests and scribes, bearing witness to age-old prophecies, while also being tangled up in complicated ways with the powers and principalities. Maybe we find our part of ourselves in the Magi, trying our best to pay attention to what we know, being willing to take risks and enter into the unknown, open to the nudging of the spirit to go home by another way, subverting the worldly powers, that are threatened by a baby. Maybe we find part of ourselves in the Holy Family, taking care of something or someone vulnerable and precious. Not entirely certain what will happen next, but being willing to take risks and enter into an unknown that feels deeply personal. I would venture to guess that we find parts of ourselves in every single one of these characters in this narrative, though we might not want to admit some of them. What are the uncharted territories and spaces within us that lie just beyond the scope of the skills and gifts that come to us so naturally and easily that usually let us know what the right step or next action may be? How might we accompany each other in exploring those uncharted territories and spaces within ourselves and within the world? As a community, I wonder how this particular story might be calling out to us where might we be being led? What signs and wonders are being revealed to us now in this moment? What epiphanies are calling, out beyond, calling us out beyond what is expected and predictable? How might we pay close attention together to these signs and wonders, stars and dreams, extending an invitation to us to trust in a power that is reflected in a God who enters into the world in the form of a tiny, vulnerable baby. The truth is God is still entering into this world. God is with us even when we cannot be with each other in the ways that we long to be. So let's keep looking up. Let's keep paying attention together to the signs and wonders, to the stars and dreams that may be pointing us toward 
what is currently out beyond our own knowing. Let's get and be curious together. And may we have the courage, the strength, the wisdom to discern when and if we need to find our way home on a path we haven't walked before. Amen. there was a lot going on in his mind and heart and spirit. From before he was born, he was being shaped and formed by people who took a different pathway, who took another road home. And he knew that his friends were going to be having to figure out a new pathway, a new road home. So as he looked around the table at his friends who were gathered with him, I imagine he had a lot of compassion for the road ahead for them. So he took the bread and broke it, and gave thanks and said, this is my body given for you. Every time you eat this meal, remember me. The same way he took the cup and gave thanks and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Every time you drink from this cup, remember me. So friends, I invite you to share in this meal in your homes, in this room where a few of us are gathered that has been prepared for each of you. May it give you the strength to take the path that you need to take.
I invite you to remember that God is still entering into this world. You're bumping into her every single day. So pay attention, and may we all have the courage to take the path that is calling out to us, the path of life, the path of hope, the path of joy. Go in peace.